welcome into the door of psychic experience. Ask and you will be given what you ask for. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. Anyone who seeks finds. If only you will knock, the door will open. And the truth within your higher spiritual self will be revealed to you. Come now with us and go where angels come and you can too. Welcome to Psychic Series. This is Reverend Doris. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, and this is the show that's being presented by the First Spiritual Church in the City Heights area of San Diego, where angels come, and so can you, any Sunday. We have resident angels, which we call our earth angels. Reverend Marcella Jones, my assistant pastor. Reverend Celine Clark, our president and Minister of Healing. We also have two licentiate ministers, Margaret Adler and Burl Bilby. And we have this metaphysical talk show that's being done once a month. This is our seventh, well, ninth anniversary actually of doing this show, which is now number 82. It's a metaphysical show about many different topics that are on the spiritual level and metaphysical as well. And we invite very special guests who have very interesting stories to tell. Tonight we have Beverly Brodsky with us. She's very, very educated in the area of near-death experiences. And I'd like to introduce her to you right now. Would you like to say hello, Beverly, to hello. the audience? And I'm going to tell the audience just a little bit about where you're coming from so they'll understand why you're doing what you are doing and why you're on this television show. Beverly Brodsky's NDE, which is near-death experience that she had, was 35 years ago. This taught her everything that matters and INS, I-A-N-D-S, gave her a voice to end 19 years of silence. An honor graduate in psychology from Vassar College with 28 years of service for the federal government as a business and computer analyst, project leader, and group leader. She started several businesses since retiring, including book editing. She's working on her own book, Return Ticket, Wisdom from Beyond Death, about her research cold from 16 years of running near-death experiences, NDE, support groups in Philadelphia and San Diego, as well as the impact of the NDA on our spiritual understanding of the material world. Her NDE is a concluding one in Dr. Kenneth Ring's book, Lessons from the Light, as the most complete in his collection. She is featured in four other books and connects with the spiritual seekers around the world through her talks and her web page. Beverly was profiled in McCall's, featured in a BBC documentary, The Human Body, gave the first NDE interview on Israeli public radio, and was included in Who's Who in America this year, 2006. Well, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Is it okay if I ask you some questions so that we can get our guests out there and the TV audience accustomed to what you're going to be talking about now? Sure. First of all, what are the elements of the near-death experience, NDE, for those out there that haven't a clue of what it is? <laughs> Well, the near-death experience is a lucid experience that people have upon being um, revived from clinical death. And um, the experience has been, usually starts with a leaving of the body 
And of course, it starts with leaving of the body and concludes with returning, or we wouldn't have these stories, passing through a dark tunnel. Mm -hmm. And um, often there is, uh, at the end of the tunnel, there is a, a light, and the, um, the, uh, the light is very bright and doesn't hurt the eyes. And people have experiences with this light in which they will hear or intuitively get messages and uh, meet beings who are, who are friendly and maybe deceased loved ones or sacred figures or even um, deceased pets. And then people will often receive information or a message to bring back. And they may see a panoramic review of the life that they have just had and from birth to death and understand what was important in that life and how they affected other people for good or for ill. And um, when they're in this light, there is a feeling of unconditional love and also of uh, transmission of knowledge and a feeling of being home in a place that is real, much more real than the place where we are now. There is often a reluctance to return to the earth plane, but this may happen because uh, people feel that they have a job to do or people are just sent back against their will sometimes. Hey, what are the different types of NDEs? Well, there are, there are really four types. The first one is called uh, an initial NDE in which there is just um, a couple of elements, such as leaving the body, encountering this darkness or the light, and having feelings of warmth and love. And this is common in children's accounts where there aren't a lot of other, um, a lot of other complicating things that happen. The second one, which is most commonly heard of, is the pleasurable or heavenly one, which is pretty much what I just accounted to you of having the feeling of going to this wonderful place where there is tremendous love and other beings and a being of light or angels and other uh, beings that are, are joyous and beautiful and loving. And the third type is um, a transcendent experience in which people are taken into a spiritual realm where there is a unit of consciousness and an expanded awareness and experiencing a realm of understanding beyond what we can express or completely understand here. And finally, the, uh, the fourth type of experience, which is a lot more rare, rarely experienced, is a distressing or hell-like experience. And um, for a long time, this was something that wasn't discussed and it was, didn't fit the definition, um, but it seems that we have, we are catching up with what happens that um, people who have these experiences aren't necessarily bad and it's not necessarily from a uh, suicide attempt. It's often just a dark night of the soul that people have these experiences. And so, there are these ver various uh, types of experiences and um, many people don't realize that they've had one because they didn't have all of the elements that were in Dr. Raymond Moody's uh, book, Life After Life, which coined the term near-death experience. And he describes all of these, um, about 14 different elements. And someone who just had one or two elements may say, well, it wasn't a near-death experience because I didn't do a, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay. but it's really not necessary. How do perspective studies, when people are questioned immediately after dying, differ from those in which people recall their experiences from the past? Well, this is something very new. We've only in the last five years had study, have had studies in which people were questioned immediately after, um, after dying and um, rather than just recalling a, an experience that happened many years earlier. 
And the first one was done in, in Holland, and there was another one in the United States, and also one in, in the UK. And one of the things that they found is that there were fewer survivors. If we look at the average um, American adult population, about 30 to 40 percent of people who have had a life-threatening event have a near-death experience, which about 5 percent of the population. Now, in these cases that were done as they happened, the actual survi the survivorship was much lower, between 8 and 14 percent. And it, it's possible that this was because it was an older group. They, the average age was in the 60s versus the, um, in the average age of the general population. And, but everything else was identical. All of the elements were identical. And um, so what, it, what this gives us that's very interesting is um, a, a comparison group, a control group, if you will, which are all the people who are questioned who didn't have a near-death experience, but who also um, passed away from some event like, like cardiac arrest and were resuscitated. And we can compare them um, and see how the near-death experience people changed. In, they both changed because they both came face to face with death, but the near-death experience people had changed in a different way and um, than those who didn't have one, such as not being afraid to die and, um, and also changing it, their beliefs to be more spiritual rather than religious. Now, what happened in your case with your own experience? Would you like to tell us about your experience? Oh, sure, okay. yes. <laughs> Well, it was um, a couple of years ago, <laughs> as you mentioned before, when I was, I was 20 years old, and um, I decided to, um, I had just arrived in California, and I accepted a, a ride on the back of a motorcycle without a helmet, which was not the smartest thing that I've ever done in my life. And we were struck by a drunken driver and I was thrown headfirst onto the highway. And I suffered a fractured skull and numerous broken bones in my head. And um, at that point, I spent a couple of weeks at UCLA Hospital. Um, I believe I was semi-comatose for a while. And then they released me and they just sent me home and with no pain medication, and, um, oh and being a, a, a very sensitive person, there was at least one dentist in my past who had retired after having me as a patient. But I was very <laughs> young and innocent and didn't know how to argue with the doctors. And um, anyhow, so I was sent back to a place where I had no roots and no ties. And I also was very, um, I was extremely distraught. I was in terrible pain. I was distraught. I was a young woman. And I had the skin ripped off the whole right side of my face. I had a crushed skull. And um, I looked like Frankenstein's bra. I was all wrapped up in bandages. Oh, he looks perfectly fine now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was hoping that side of my face would age slower than the other side because <laughs> I got all new skin at age 20. But no, no such luck. And I just uh, threw myself down on this bed where, at, at this place where I was staying, and I said I had been an atheist or a skeptic, but in the foxhole we all become agnostics. And I said, well, God, if you're up there, you can have me now because I can't go through this. I couldn't see going through the pain. And as I said, I had no support system there, and, and I, I was concerned that I would be um, maimed and no man would love me and I would never have, you know, that my life was over. And so I just really surrendered myself and I went into, um, I just lifted up out of my body and I found myself on the ceiling of the room where I was staying and there before me was this radiant angel. And at first I was just really surprised because 
I didn't believe in angels. <laughs> that was just a decoration on top of a Christmas that tree. That was the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was Jewish, so I thought, was there some mistake? But I, I was just also really not educated, not very knowledgeable about, of course, there are angels in the Old Testament all over yes, the place. Yes, there is. And, um, and then I, and this being was very beautiful, and he had this light from within. He just shone from within, and he was in these white flowing robes. And, um, and then I had this feeling of great comfort and peace, as if this were someone that I knew. And, um, and I had no questions, but he took my hand, such as it was, and, um, and I should also mention there was nothing wrong with me at this point. There, were, there was no um, horrible contusion on my face. I also had perfect vision. I, could, I had been declared legally blind without my glasses at 17. And, um, you know, I was, I was fine. I was in this etheric body that was perfect. And so he took my hand, such as it was, and we went flying out through the window out over the ocean. This was in Venice Beach, California. And it didn't bother me. It was as if I'd been flying through windows all my <laughs> life. <laughs> and so um, I didn't look down at the ocean, which I always loved the ocean, but up above us and angled up to, to the right was this darkened area like a funnel. And um, it was very dark and there was this pinpoint of light at the far end. And um, I had never heard of these experiences. I had no idea what was going on, but um, we went through this area and I have to also state that it was in a dimension that was beyond time and space as we know it. Um, so I couldn't say how far it was. It could have been the whole universe or it could have been just a tiny sliver of a jump to another reality and also that it felt I felt so good and so alive well there. how long did you still stay, stay there there was no time <laughs> time didn't exist <laughs> so right? it's hard and also I was alone so it, it's hard to um, you know I wasn't being monitored but then at the far end at, at some point I got to the other end the angel was gone and there before me was this living presence this the being of light and um, this is where it is hard to find words, words in our exist. in our uh, language That's that do right. justice to this. I've but heard that before. The way um, uh, w what I perceived was that this being contained everything that ever is, was, and will be, and also that um, it contained perfect knowledge of everything of how everything works and also perfect justice. And, um, and this being was just loving me, just pouring out this unconditional love. And I was, I was, now I was really amazed because I thought, well, this isn't the guy on top of the Sistine Chapel. No. <laughs> but I guess this must be God. And um, I had a few issues. <laughs> <laughs> so when you you woke from this experience, you were not the same person anymore. No, but anyhow, I got to have this whole big telepathic exchange of all of my big questions, all the big whys, especially this business about the justice bothered me because it seemed that this world that I'd come from, um, it, there didn't seem to be a reflection of, um, of this perfect justice. And so, um, but then all of my questions were answered. This will happen telepathically. There were no words. There was no need for you didn't words. You have to have words. And so, and as I received the answers, the amazing thing that I do bring back is that I said inside of myself, oh yes, of course, I knew that. How could I ever have forgotten? And did you remember it all? And I remembered everything. Well, I don't bring it back, but I understood the plan how everything was designed and meant to work. That this really is not a random universe, that this was a very intri intricately constructed um, universe in which everything is connected. And then um, the being of light, um, who I 
feel was God, took me on this tour of the universe. And at this point, I was just consciousness. I was no longer even in this ethereal body. And we went zipping around at looking at all of the, um, all of creation, the, the stars and the, uh, the galaxies and um, starbursts and nebula and all these wonderful, beautiful things. And then we got to this star that seemed to be at the very center of all things. And it seemed that it had just been created. It was newly formed. And we flew into the center of this star through all of the fire and, but I wasn't afraid because I wasn't in the body and I was completely protected and loved. And then we got to this place in the center and all objects vanished. There was no more star. There was no more light. But what there, there was this richly full presence of um, being in this void, primordial void before there was, like before the Big Bang, and being in, um, and having the feeling of merging with the being of light so that I was like this drop in the cosmic ocean with all, one with all things, and yet there was still a little Beverly that came out and said, oh, this is really happening to me. So I was one, and yet I knew that, that I was separate. Now, what was your after effects of all of this when the days and the m weeks and months and years later? Well, um, when I, when I first came back, I was so filled with this love. It was all that I could see. I could see this love and light, little sparks of it, in everyone and everything. I saw it in, um, in, all, in, in people and in plants and animals and um, even every gran grain of sand on the beach. There was nowhere I could look. The molecules in the air were filled with light. And I just wanted to share this love. I was just like, like a child. I was just filled with this love. And the world would have none of it <laughs> or didn't really care for that kind of approach. I have a quick question because we're almost at the end of okay. our interview here. You said something about that you didn't have good eyesight before this happened. Mm -hmm. Well. Can you tell me, do people who have been blind from birth report NDs too? Oh, yes, they do. They do. And it's, uh, all of the phenomenology is the same as what sighted people have, except when they are out of their body in the initial phase and they first get visual um, images, it's very strange to them. It's mm -hmm. as if we were to get another uh, another sense or suddenly we were smelling out of our elbow or something strange mm -hmm. but then when they go into the transcendental realm when they <coughs> if they go through the tunnel and they encounter the being of light they say oh this is the way it should have been and they feel that it's easy and natural and this is very interesting because they can do <coughs> retinal implants with um, blind people <coughs> But people can't see mm -hmm. right away. They have to have months and months of training for the brain to establish the pathway so that they recognize mm -hmm. what it is. Okay. Well, we're just about ready to close here. And I just really quickly would like to ask you, um, do NDEs compare with mystical experiences too? Yes, they do very much, and there are, <coughs> there are a number of elements that, um, in the study of mysticism, um, there are so many overlaps that mystical experiences have been called near-death-like experiences because there are so many things that, that happen that are similar, but some <coughs> of the common ones are a feeling of, of unity consciousness. Many people do report seeing beings of light, feeling the transcendence of time and space, feeling the oneness, the ecstasy, mm -hmm. the holiness of the experience, and the ineffability, not being able to describe it in words. 
So it there is aren't words similar. for it, are there? No. Our, the English language does not do it justice because we have, you know, the subject and the object. We have things that are separate when we're in a different a place where there is this um, connection and unity that um, it's hard to even mm -hmm. comprehend, mm -hmm. let alone express. Well, I'm looking forward to your workshop and your lecture that you're going to be doing for us in our church. I want to thank you very much for coming today and well, sharing with us. I think we probably could have talked for another half an hour. <laughs> that would have been easy to do. And okay. thank you so much for having me, Reverend Doris. I and really I want to thank, thank our crew for helping us. And again, this is presented by the First Spiritualist Church where angels come and so can you. Any Sunday, you'll find us there. And keep tuned. We love you and keep watching. And God bless all of you. Goodbye for now. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.